Bill, come on up. I want to show your book. Bill read last week and just absolutely knocked my socks off. This is a new tome of his I want to show you. Do you have any of the books here that I can I show? Have, uh, Give me one. Give me one I can put on camera. Yeah. Secundity facility. Can you see that? This is, come here, brother. This is a dear, dear soul friend of mine. Come on, get in the camera. Oh, camera, camera. <laughs> um, you're gonna like this. This is a very brilliant, gifted soul who's been documenting his work, which is to the benefit of mankind. Hold on your hats. Let me frame you here. Am I good? You certainly is, Ollie. Thank you, Caden, for uh, inviting me this evening. Oh, you're welcome to come in. Um, so we probably all just sort of finished dinner lately, recently. So all the blood is now draining from our heads to our tummies. So, uh, I'll, I'll try not to put you to sleep. <laughs> so we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, Aiden, I just put together sort of a potpourri of things to read. Whatever. If, uh, if you think that it's time for me to shut up, just buzz me or something, right? Rock and roll, my friend. Let it rip. Slow dance. I led you across the smooth hardwood floor on an early Sunday morning. I wore my striped winter Waldo socks and you donned provocative flan. We danced like banished fools aboard the Flying Dutchman. I was the thin man and you were Nora, solving the mystery of the English waltz. With each step slower than the last, our grizzled timelines began to fade. I sang a song to you while you held on for fear of falling fast. But we kept the tempo slow, forever swaying with every pitch and yaw. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Where, okay, where am I going here? Where am I going? Hang on. If you show me yours. <laughs> I love this already. <laughs> it's a game we played when Bugs and Daffy became passé. When the best part of the Sears catalog was no longer Lincoln Logs and chemistry sets, we exchanged peach fuzz peaks behind clapboard garages or under schoolyard elm trees. There were rules. We had to be normal children, just under the curious influence of estrogen and testosterone. We had to have working parents who gave us lunch money and took us bowling on our birthday. We had to be mainstreamed with goals that went far beyond tomorrow's ride on the small bus. If we were overtaken by this spell, if our lustful simplicity suggested that a clueless child should handle our ripening fruit, we would surely have been put somewhere. <laughs> and of course, there had to be an invitation, a furtive glance from the girl painting her toenails on the front porch steps. <laughs> oh, yeah. The color of music. I'm sitting in a room with three friends. There's some blood mixed in 
pretty good stereo, decent speakers. I don't know the average friend count for people my age or my chemistry, but at last count I had three. Each one of us has music in their head, the best music they can think of, segues, riffs, crescendos. I think there should be a friend manual with schematics, triangle warming, warning signs, and a chapter on troubleshooting. Listening to the music in their head, muting Anderson's trilling flute to make room for a friend's Georgia fiddle. We each ambled down some lover's lane during the British invasion. Johnny found Lennon and Bobby found Garcia. The manual could, should caution that friends are not mirror images. They are like cans of Benjamin Moore's Chantilly lace. They, their lot numbers don't match, so they listen to the same tune, but in different hues, basking in a kaleidoscope of melody. Where do I put it? Hang on, hold the phone. This is a piece called, um, haven't read this in a long time. This is a piece called Man Made, and it's probably more of a, a piece about my wife than, than myself, perhaps. On a Sunday morning, you press my sharp creases while I share the back burner with some concoction slowly reduced to a fraction of what it was. But you have sent me away to slice Slassingers into the woods or leave Rapalas at the bottom of the Never Sink Reservoir. So many things I believe you have let me see and do. Your green eyes just a little misty. Saturday night trifectas while you watched old Colombo reruns. Friday nights in a smoky poker room while you filled your nook with true crime and lost lovers. When I come home and taste that savory concoction, you fix me with your emerald curiosity, and then I know. It was never about latitudes and liberties. It was about the man that you want me to be. While these hands still work, these eyes can see, and this heart so very grateful. Bravo. Moving right on. Sometimes I think when I read this, it's a little bit too revealing, but what the hell? Okay. I like the other stuff. <laughs> the Dirty River. When the tuition money ran out, I worked construction, and Bob joined the Navy. The boss's daughter sold weed that I hid in the vent pipe. I was lost just like the rippling paths of factory lights that lose themselves in a whirling whisper on a dirty Hudson shore. Where I drank Colt 45 from a quart bottle and watched Ray Ray vomit under the high tension wires. Bob came home on furlough with chocolate mescaline that tasted like Nestle's Quick. He thought he was going to die. So I said we should go bowling. <laughs> he bowled, he lived. He went back to Newport on Monday and I learned how to drive a forklift. In July, we returned to the riverfront with Benny's from some petty officer. Benny's and weed 
enhanced the July fireworks that played off the dirty water and the glimmering hats of the drunken firemen. The scent of black powder and sulfur settled over the coarse sand, littered with empty beer bottles and the small faint footprints of the scrabbling river rats. Yeah, okay, okay. Were it not for the wind, the white noise of the rustling ash and hickory would not slow down every minute of a late August afternoon. The hackberry would not abort its overabundance of that which has grown old. The small leaves of the spidery cleone would not shimmer and tremble like a migrating school of silver minnows. The tubular chimes would hang limply like broken wings and broken bones. The cold rain would stay longer. The lace curtains would not be a billowing sea swell or the ethereal movements of a peasant's dress. There would be no dancing ferns and sailing water lilies. Were it not for the wind, the shadows would not morph like time-lapse photography of cumulus clouds, valley fog, and the grain of old men and old dogs. There would be only silence and no maestro in the sky. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, right about now, this doesn't really mean much. I mean, this, this poem. This means everything. But in, a, in a, a few months from now, in a couple of months from now, maybe even a month from now, a couple months from now, especially if you live in Sullivan County, this will mean everything to you. Okay? Five to ten. It snows like a barroom brawl. Mm. After the last punch is thrown, after the last shard of broken glass clinks to an otherwise silent aftermath, the sheriff nudges the fallen drifters with the tip of his boot, thankful that their bluster has gone to sleep. It snows like a bad symphony discordant violins that sound like the wind moaning while it assaults the trees, the senses, and the small of your back. It snows like an unfinished masterpiece. It snows like a runaway locomotive, like a, the makings of an evil sorcerer's tomb. It snows like a picture-perfect mansion under construction, jagged edges, ugly piles of scrap and danger around every corner. It snows like a disease. Oh, God. <laughs> then you run out of gas and you yeah, have to shovel. Right. <laughs> this is called Sometimes. Sometimes when you speak, I can't comprehend what you're saying. The words are lost in the noise, the hum of yesterday's laughter, and the emanations that clang and clatter. You could be asking me if the roads are icy or telling me that Phoebe ate my lottery ticket. All could be drowned out because an aroma makes noise. I can hear the beef stew. <laughs> Sometimes when I speak, I can't comprehend what I'm saying. I spew some gibberish because you're wearing flip-flops and your feet are still of interest to you. <laughs> you could be wearing chain mail and I could still find something of interest. Your answers to why the squirrels must be fed, your voice pleading, oh please, oh please, scratch my back. 
Sometimes the white noise from the Brookstone box is the distant rumble of the IRT Express as we huddle in the bowels under Lexington. You breathe softly while I sip the Bally High. You might tell me it's time to move along to find some new underground hideaway. Then I wake to the morning sun and the bouquet of violins playing in the folds you left behind. Sometimes. Okay. So this is a letter to my father. Hey Dad, last night I Googled the archives. I found your baby face black and white yearbook picture with a small inscription. It said you were easygoing, but lightning on the tennis court. But I have no photos, no stories to tell about your prowess on grass or clay. And for this, I am sorry. I am sorry that some ancestor high in the Urals handed down a genetic bullseye and plastered it across your stern. Modern medicine was some years behind you. The interventions to make you whole were only on paper, were maybes and what ifs. So you popped nitro each day to climb a few stairs or carry a bag of groceries. When I was 12, I watched you slump into the corner of our small kitchen. Your eyes rolled back like some zombie in an old horror movie. I wish you could have gone to some big city where a renowned PhD would deftly plant some small miracle cylinders into your calcified power lines. And he would say, go ahead, Mr. G. Go out there and be that lightning once again. But that's not how things went. My mother helped you from the kitchen to your bed that day. You said, kept saying you were cold. In so many ways, your life had been taken long before you were laid to rest. You survived like an old Chevy that could only handle 30 on the local roads. You carried those little white pills, watched baseball, and washed the dinner dishes. But oh, how I wish you could have saved me, aced me with your power, sir. And you would vault a net, shake my hand, smile a bit smugly and say, pardon the iron grasp. Only this time you would mean it. Erasing history. Removing colors from the human rainbow, making the past disappear is a risky business. Send deadly spores in a time machine to eradicate the simian population and we all wake up with webbed feet. But decisions have been made to change the past in the hope that biases and stereotypes will magically disappear. Rip Frank Brown's familiar face from a box of rice and voila, the rice-eating world will savor a new recipe. So pieces of history continue to be removed like damaged kidneys or invasive overgrown shrubs Rice growers and pancake makers are whisked away as if they never existed. The history that I ate, drank, and remember has become 
but a bucket of water poured onto a dry asphalt slope, leaving part of itself behind until a trickle meanders to nothing. Recent history. Dusk. There is an ebbing of spirit. The part that marvels at a sailor's sunset or finds solitude in the noise that crickets make. In the coming twilight, I will take a life-sustaining walk past rolling pastures and century-old farmhouses. My arms and legs will function like the involuntary beating of a heart. I do hope that one day soon, a resolute spirit will resurface, one that yearns fascination like those that come and flutter their powdered wings, seeking but a brief respite from the darkness. One that can laugh along with the farmer's children at the morning bus stop. One that can acquiesce to the fading light of days. Well, this is apropos. It is, it is fall now, right? It's autumn. Autumn song on the rail trail. The crackle of fallen hickory leaves added a bit of percussion to, to the rhythmic melody of my breath. But this song was a lesser sequel. The original, Violins of Breeze, and the crescendo of a diesel engine pulling out of Hurleyville's Luzon Station. One of those songs that has a long fade out, background dissonant sounds of a superhighway, while the muted whistle of the Ontario and Western fades to the soft whir of my bicycle tires and roller blades on the smooth asphalt, fades to the murmurings of young lovers ambling down their newfound lover's lane. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Portraits of mothers and fathers. He kissed my mother's salty forehead on the evening I was born. There were no, there were not, they were not painted or drawn, not stick figures with a dull pencil on a piece of scrap. Uncle Fred should have seen them carry me through Chauncey's Park. He could have snapped a candid shot with his little black box. The snow came early in the December of my birth. All I have is what I remember, decades after love letters and a bowling alley romance. I have no tea set heirlooms or cherished seven irons. Four children leave no room for an intimate rendezvous. Children fill the photo scrapbooks laying on the white semi-gloss, scarred with black cigarette burns in the home where they lived until their death. Mothers collect green stamps and read Earl Stanley Gardner in the late night laundromat beside the diner that sells cheap coffee and has a cigarette machine. Mothers do without color TVs and champagne brunches so the children can have lunch money and cowboy boots. 
Mothers scream when they think their children are sleeping. Fathers come home after a double shift at the factory, smelling like yeast and sweat. They throw sand and lye across the sunken ground to quell the stench of a saturated leach field. They count the bills and check to see who's trotting at Yonkers. Fathers talk about driving over a landmine in an army truck, but the, converse, but the discussion never goes beyond that point. Fathers never give the car keys to a screaming woman. Mothers and fathers were once husbands and wives were once friends and lovers. I want that part of the story in a scalloped frame. Not the picture of her throwing the glass pitcher as he scrambles down the back stairs to go play the Daily Double. I want the portrait of a mother in the dress he loved. The portrait of a father teaching her to bowl. I want the portraits of everything beyond the reach of my tainted memory. Oh, I'm almost done, I'm almost done. Stick that in there. The Deacon's Lament. Five years after Uncle Kenneth came home from the big one, two things happened. I was born and Kenneth began to paint. His sky was an empty home void of children. Each stone in the stream a cobblestone from Church Lane just outside Manchester. She is looking down into the water. He will only allow himself a subtle profile, a reflection in the stream sluicing around her perfect toes. The instructions for servicemen in Britain said not to show off and never to criticize the king or queen. There were no rules about falling in love. He left her in a village outside of Essex after Operation Overlord. He left her there like a half glass of Guinness left at the pub because there was a plane to catch. He flew home to Mama and joined the Dutch Reformed Church. When the calling came, he became the deacon. He polished pews, painted bingo signs, and painted a memory. We learn of the broken hearts of fathers and uncles only when we ourselves have grown old, when wars are history and wounds have scarred over. I sat on his knee while he read the Sunday comics to me. She was on the wall in a golden scalloped frame. The cigarette in her slender fingers was so natural. If I knew that she was more than a piece of his imagination, if I knew that each brush stroke of her golden hair was a heartache, I would have said that I was sorry. I remember being a little kid and seeing this painting on the wall of this young lady sitting on the rock next to a stream. And I just thought it was something that he thought up to paint. But I found out years later that that was a woman that he loved when he was a soldier. Okay. When Benny King sang Spanish Harlem. At times, it will be a scent, 
to conjure up that rocky knoll beside the railroad tracks where Diana and I sat Indian style. I shot agates while she played jacks. On other days, it will be a melody that flows like the slow East River, where Mario wept onto his dominoes when the city's finest had to deliver news from the turf near First Avenue, where his delicate rose was found floating, until they pulled her onto a concrete slab where a dragon sat casually gloating. Some dark-faced hombre had caught her eye, wanting to plant her in his garden. But a street dragon knows those things only happen when Benny King sang Spanish Harlem. In the blistering summer of 1962, Officer Cruz felt useless in El Barrio from table to table in Marcus Garvey Park, he finally found Gloria and Mario. I sat in the back of my father's Packard, wondering how far it was to the city and how long a body can float on a river. The weatherman said there'd be stifling humidity. Daddy opened more windows and lit up a candle. He blew smoke out his nose and turned off the news, searching AM stations for top 40 music, or maybe the breakfast club views. He tuned to the voice of Cousin Bruce and all of the crooners who had ridden to stardom. Well, I just closed my eyes and made some connection when Benny King sang Spanish Harlem. Thank you. Thank you. I have the book with you. Certainly. Um, once again, that is that tone. I think Bill is a staggering genius. The sensitivity of his portrait of mankind just takes my breath away. Bless you, sir. <laughs>